Hello, my name is Kern, and I want to talk about Invasion of Segovia, which is one of the new battle sieges that we got in March of the Machines. I think that it has amazing competitive potential, both in Standard and maybe even in Historic, where the card is even better and more broken, but where the format is you know, just that much more competitive, and so maybe there's not quite as much room with it. In any case, I think it's very competitive and viable, but a lot of people are going to try to brew with it, and then they're going to decide that it's a bad card, it's too conditional, it doesn't do enough when it enters. It, I think that there are many traps in brewing with this card that a lot of people will fall right into, because I've seen this over and over and over again with slightly conditional but otherwise very good competitive cards um, that people will sleep on until the very end of right before they rotate and people have finally had enough time to try to do something with them. So this is an unusual video where I'm going to kind of give you some tips about how to brew with this card and some cards that I think you should be thinking about when you do so. So first of all, what is Invasion of Segovia? Well, it is a two in a blue casting cost for a four defense counter battle that reads when it enters, create two one one blue Kraken creature tokens with trample. And if you're able to flip it by attacking down or otherwise removing all four of those defense counters, it flips into a legendary serpent creature that has three power and three toughness and reads non-creature spells you cast have convoke. That is very, very good. So now you can tap them to pay the casting costs of non-creature spells. And it has this additional upside that at the beginning of your end step, untap up to four target creatures. Now, of course, if this were just three mana to cast that side, this would be obviously good, and people would be playing this all over the place. Um, the fact that it creates two bodies for you with three mana first like, does not pay you off, I guess, for having to find some way to flip it to get this additional body out of it. You know, if it were just cast this spell and get this card, even if it were four mana, maybe even if it were five mana, this would still be very, very good. But that's not the case. So as with a lot of cases and a lot of card evaluation, you want to evaluate a card based off of what it does for you immediately. You know, does it force removal out of your opponent's hand? Or, you know, and if it does get removed, did it do something when it entered the battlefield? In today's, like, very powerful environment, you know, where all the cards we're seeing have been so power creeped, that's very important and a good thing to consider when evaluating a card. With Invasion of Segovia, it's not just that the battle could be removed before you can attack it down, it's the fact that you have to attack it down in order to flip it into Cadus. So a lot of battles are being evaluated correctly, I think, purely based off of what they do when they come down. And then there's this added potential upside, theoretical upside, if you were able to flip the card. So I think that that's generally wise. I think with this card, that's not the correct way to think about brewing with it. And that's the problem. I think people are gonna brew with it from that perspective. They're gonna wedge it into decks that seem like they might want to play it um, and just play a few copies to see how it plays and it's not gonna go well. Because this is the kind of card that you, if you wanna play with this and you want it to reach its full competitive potential, you have to commit 100%. You can't be halfsies. Like your whole deck strategy needs to revolve around being able to not only consistently flip this card, but also get enough value out of it when you do that it's gonna make an enormous impact on your games. And that often requires you to play different cards than you normally would that would be slightly less competitive otherwise. So like a card like this doesn't play as well in mid-range uh, as it does in a deck like Combo that you can really you know, afford to create a whole strategy around. So that's what I think, that's like the main nugget if you don't take anything else away from this short video. That's what I want you to know. If you're gonna brew with this card, you can't just play a few copies in an otherwise normal deck or a good deck, a conventional deck. You have to really brew around it as a central piece of the deck. Um, so the big thing that I think that you should be playing more than any other card I'm gonna show off here is Silver Scrutiny, in standard at least. In, in uh, Historic, there are many other options. There are many other ways you could go off with Invasion of Segovia, a finale of of um, Revelation is one of them that's a very similar effect that's even better than this card. But in standard, this is the card I think in every single deck you should be playing Silver Scrutiny um, because it is a wonderful payoff. So when you do flip Invasion and you have the Cadus down, now you can tap your creatures to make this X even bigger. Even on the floor, like the floor of this card is, um, you know, you have to cast it for a three or less. Even with a flipped uh, invasion, that's still pretty good. That's really good synergy. You don't have to have all your creatures untapped. You don't even have to have very many of them. Even if you can just cast this for X, two, or three, but you're using creatures to do that. And remember, 
Cadis will untap up to four target creatures um, at the beginning of your end step. So you're very likely to have that mana, even after you might have had to commit mana that same turn in order to create a board presence and you know remove a, remove a target or something like that in order to get through and flip Cadis. You're still likely to have you know four or five quote unquote mana you know or creatures to convoke that up so that you can cast this at instant speed on your opponent's turn. That's some pretty big tempo. Like you've essentially let's say you've spent four of your five mana that turn. Um, but, you know, you have four creatures up otherwise so that on your opponent's turn you're also drawing three cards. That's amazing. Uh, you're not taking a turn off to gas your hand back up. And if that's all the use you get out of this flipped Cadis before it gets destroyed, then you're, you're sitting pretty. So this is why Silver Scrutiny is good. It's really decent anyway. I mean, it's a good competitive card anyway. It's good immediately after you flip Cadis and then it gets even better if you're able to create even more of a board presence or untap with Cadis, you know, and then just... Uh, cast this at sorcery speed using all the available mana and creatures you have to convoke it. So very good. Geist Wave is the other blue card I think that you might be considering. Um, and it's not just Geist Wave. Um, I'll talk a little more generally. The reason why I'm putting Geist Wave here is a very unusual card. Uh, we have more competitive bounce cards, I feel like, in standard than Geist Wave. Um, there's a particular reason why I've chosen this one to highlight, but the important thing is that it's bounce. That's what you want to be thinking about. Um, I have videos on an archetype of magic that I call Draw to Win that often looks very similar to combo uh, or sometimes it can look similar to mid-range depending on the deck that it's in but in any case it, i think that there's these common properties between decks that have insane amount of card draw when you get enough card draw what happens is the whole concept of card advantage doesn't make any sense anymore and this is sort of heading in that direction with Cadis and Silver Scrutiny. If you're playing four copies of this, four copies of that, and your strategy is very centered around being able to flip Cadis consistently, and you know you have other ways to find your Silver Scrutinies, like let's say you're also playing four Impulse, which I think would probably be good in that style of deck, then um, what happens is you're gonna very consistently be able to draw a ton of cards. And it's not that you have better card advantage than your opponent, that's not what's happening. It's that if you can draw cards enough cards consistently enough, suddenly the concept doesn't make sense anymore and you can play magic in a way you wouldn't ordinarily play. The downside of bounce is that typically it's card disadvantage. You know, you might bounce, you know, say their Titan of Industry back to their hand, and so they have to recast it and take a turn off to do that. It's very good tempo, but you've lost your card permanently, your bounce card, and they have kept their creature. So it's card disadvantage, which is why you don't see it, you know, super often in just any old deck. You know, you need a deck that's very centered around tempo. That's typically where bounce is played, is in tempo. Or when there's a card like Brazen Borrower, which doesn't represent card disadvantage because it has some other way to give you a card to replace itself. You know, Brazen Borrower, you could then cast the, um, the creature side after doing the adventure of the bounce, and that way you didn't lose a card. Geist Wave can be similar, but only if you've targeted your own permanent will it draw a card. If you do that in that case, and let's say it's a permanent you want to cast again, and you're not just doing that to protect it, but you actually want to cast it again to gain some benefit, then you've essentially gone one card up via this bounce spell. So, But that's a really unusual use case, because the fact that it's card disadvantage matters most when you're targeting an opponent's thing, and Geist Wave doesn't cover that. But the reason that I've picked Geist Wave in particular here to show off like the bounce strategy is that... In standard, you're going to be wanting to play cards like Invasion of New Phyrexia, and this is an this is an excellent combo along with Invasion of Segovia. Going wide is going to be good for a number of reasons. It's going to help you to flip your invasion for one, but also it's going to create extra creatures at a very cheap rate, you know, comparatively, um, so that you can then use them to convoke additional spells, including this spell itself, Invasion of New Phyrexia. These tokens are excellently paired with Invasion of Segovia because they have Vigilance. So you can attack with them the same turn, maybe help you flip the invasion, but they're still untapped to help convoke a spell with that flipped invasion. So a wonderful combo. If you're playing, you know, a card like Invasion of New Phyrexia, then Geist Wave gets pretty good because there's a lot of scenarios where you would like to bounce this back to your hand to replay it to make more 2-2 um, two -two white and blue knight vigilant creature tokens. One of the cool things about this is that, you know, you're essentially creating X creatures equal to two plus the mana that you spent, or rather the mana you spent minus two <laughs> is what I meant to say. So if you cast, you know, if you're casting this using seven mana or convoking with creatures up to seven, right, then you're creating five creatures. But those creatures, 
they don't, um, they have summoning sickness, but that doesn't affect Convoke. And this is another thing that I think a lot of people will miss when they're going to brew around with this card is, is how the synergy really operates. It's very critical to understand that new creatures you're making, even via other, you know, even via convoking it with other creatures you already have on the board, those new creatures can be immediately used to convoke new spells. So let's say you cast this invasion of new Phyrexia, you tap out all your mana, all your creatures, and you've made five more creatures at a rate of basically seven mana or seven creatures you've tapped. Now those five creatures are immediately available to cast another spell like uh, X3 Silver Scrutiny or um, a Geist Wave, or it's also, you know, that mana is useful to cast another Invasion of New Phyrexia. Now your X cost is three, you're spending five total quote unquote mana, really just convocable creatures, to play it again. Also important to note that the creatures for Invasion of New Phyrexia are both white and blue, so you can use them to cast white spells, which is pretty important because Convoke, you know, Convoke is nice that it can, it can um, you can use your creatures to pay the costs of colored mana as well, but they have to be of that color. Um, it's nice that Invasion of Segovia does make blue to blue creatures rather than like it say it could have made colorless creatures because that is actually helpful, but that's another good thing about these white and blue night creature tokens. Mondrock, so getting more into the white color, this is like not a card. These, you know, these three cards I think are very critical and maybe even this one too for you to be thinking about. Of course, these you would only be doing if you're playing a white and blue strategy, which I don't think that this only fits in a white and blue strategy, which is why I've kind of separated out these blue cards. Um, but uh, I would say these are like the most worth considering in white and blue. This is sort of an edge case card, Mondrak Glory Dominus. Um, it can double the amount of tokens you're creating. And that's really good with Invasion of Segovia because I think you're going to want to be playing this in a token strategy deck because that's the best way to go wide quickly in order to get more creatures to help you convoke more spells. It's sort of somewhat a nombo because it's a creature, so you can't use your creatures to convoke for Mondrak even if you have flipped the Invasion of Segovia. But um, otherwise, it's very good to be able to double up your tokens. I've been brewing with this a bit, and sometimes it feels like win more in some decks in other decks that are more mid-range, then this kind of can stand on its own and do its thing. So it just depends on what deck it's in. The fact that it can make itself indestructible is also relevant because, and this is a very non-obvious thing, I think in an Invasion of Segovia deck, you want to be playing board wipes, <laughs> which is very counterintuitive because I think in Invasion of Segovia, you want a go wide strategy. Maybe it's even tokens. Um, and, you know, the thing itself doesn't flip into an enchantment. It flips into a creature. And so that is vulnerable to being wiped. But I think that you do want to be playing board wipes and White Sun's Twilight is a very good one. Phasing of Zalfir is another one you may consider, but there has to be very specific, um, you know, things going on in your deck to make that even viable because what Phasing of Zalfir does, did I spell that wrong? Uh, oh yeah, there we go. What it does is it, you know, it'll wipe the whole board and it'll replace all the creatures on the board with 2-2 two -two black friction creature tokens. So if you're wider than your opponent, then it sort of acts as a one-sided board wipe. It can also downgrade their car, uh, creatures while maybe even upgrading yours, depending on what your creatures were, but at least just side grading them. So I think that this can often feel like a one-sided board wipe, but it's conditional. You have to have been able to get on the board, you know, more than your opponent. You could potentially cast this early, but... Oftentimes, I think you're not going to be able to go as wide against your opponent as early in the decks you'd want to cast this early. Like, for instance, in Mono Red, they're going to be able to pump out more creatures than you um, early game, like, you know, by turns one, two, and three than you are. And so this wipe doesn't feel as good there. That's why I say that this is more conditional than White Sun's Twilight. But if you're playing in white, White Sun's Twilight is very good. Very, very good. So let's talk about why and some of the non-obvious reasons. If you flipped an Invasion of Segovia in, into Cadus, you probably still want to play White Sun's Twilight. That's what I found. It's, it's honestly often a very good play, even though it means you're going to be getting rid of your Cadus. The reason is, you know, typically this is not a wipe until you, it's like turn seven, or if you've had some ramp, maybe it's turn six, right? It's, it's not right away that this becomes a wipe. You have to work for it, um, which is sort of what gets it out of reach for being the only wipe in a control deck, you typically need to have, you know, a four mana, five mana board wipe as well in order to, to be able to consistently do your control thing. But with a flipped invasion of Segovia and Decatus, now you can potentially um, convoke this even earlier, you know, much earlier than turn seven or more consistently, even if you're still doing it on turn seven, you know, you don't have to hit your land drop every turn. 
if you've been able to flip a Cadus. And so that's a wonderful payoff for a flipped Cadus. If all you do is you're able to cast a bigger board wipe earlier with White Sun's Twilight, that's very good. Now it has the great upside that it replaces, it sort of replaces a lot of the creatures you removed. Now you've gotten rid of your Cadus, that's unfortunate, but you've gotten right back on the board with at least five, maybe more, you know, Phyrexian might. So when you do put down another invasion of Segovia and you're working at flipping it again, you now have access to a lot of more creatures that can convoke. And of course, if you're able to do a board wipe like that and put a lot of mites down, you're now threatening a toxic victory. So this acts as a sort of very real threatening win condition. So again, it's it's good, actually. It's good to cast White Sun's Twilight even when your Cadus is on the board. Often that's what you want to do. So non-obvious, but if you're brewing around with this in blue and white, which I think is maybe the best colors and standard to be doing uh, an Invasion of Segovia deck in, then I would heavily consider this card. Uh, let's talk about some other color pairings, or maybe if you're going to do like a tricolor deck, some of these colors might go together. The first one is sort of its, its own. It would just be is it, but it's it's red. So let's talk about blue and red and how this fits in with, with Invasion of Segovia. The blue-red is it prowess spells deck that's seeing a lot of play right now. I don't know if it's going to last long, but... Um, it's seeing a lot of play currently. That, I think, is the best candidate for just being able to slot an Invasion of Segovia without much more effort. I think you would want to put in more effort, like playing Silver Scrutiny um, in this deck that doesn't typically play it, but <clears throat> I think that there's room for maybe thinking about how you could change out a few cards. So let's take a look at why this works well. So we have Kenra Spell Spear, which flips into Gitaxian Spell Stalker, which has double prowess and trample. So on its own, it can help you inflip the invasion, but of course, it's also really good to be convoking a lot of non-creature spells because every non-creature spell you cast will increase the prowess you know, effects of your other creatures like Ataxian Spellstalker. Nice to note too that um, it itself is a non-creature spell, like when you cast Invasion of Segovia, and it makes two 1-1 tokens, which this deck wants to do already because the decks I've seen uh, are playing Balmor Battle Mage Captain to essentially give all of your other creatures, you know, a kind of form of prowess. It's not exactly prowess, but it pumps them all up by one when you cast an instant or sorcery spell. So it's not just non-creature and they gain trample until end of turn. So if you have a lot of other instants and sorceries other than Invasion of Segovia, which is not an instant sorcery, unfortunately, but still, then having those additional 1-1 one, one blue tramplers um, is nice. And the fact that they say trample on them, you know, maybe even is relevant. I mean, Balmor gives them trample anyway, if that's the way that you were pumping them up. But what I'm trying to say is that there already is a go-wide strategy in the Izzet colors. And so the two 1-1 one, one tokens you make with Invasion of Segovia aren't exactly nothing. They're not a good rate, you know, for three mana. There's other spells you want to play if that's the only reason this were there. But I'm saying it does synergize well already in the deck. And then, you know, you have cards like Third Path Iconoclast, which are going to pump out a 1-1 one, one soldier creature token every time you cast a non-creature spell, which includes battle. So now it's making three tokens if you have a Third Path Iconoclast down, which makes this a very good turn two, turn three. Very good. Also good, turn two, turn three. That's pretty nice. Also good, turn two, <laughs> turn three. Although you probably might want to transform this first, it's still a line that you could choose to do. And then attack in with your Kenra Spell Spear and attack this uh, Cadus down and you know get that much closer to flipping it. So these cards already work very well with Invasion of Segovia. I'm a little bit surprised not to see more people playing around with it, but I think the reason is exactly what I said at the beginning of this video. People will be evaluating this card like they do most other cards um, in which they're saying, what does this say right when it comes down? What is its non-conditional use case? What is the total floor? And then they're going to write it off for that reason. Even if they brew with it, they're going to find that they don't often flip Cadis, or that's not what they want to do. They'd rather go face, or when they do, they can't take maximum value out of it because they don't have some big payoff. And I think that's the reason why it's probably not seeing a lot of play right now. I, I might take, you know, I might take my... I might take my smack talk to the ball court. I don't know. I'm trying to think of an idiom that's appropriate here and try to brew around with the is at prowess myself along with invasion. And I might discover that there just isn't room for it in that deck. But I am really curious. And I think that a lot of people who do even think to experiment with invasion of Segovia will quickly write it off because they're not going to fully commit to this card. And I think if you do fully commit to the card, you're going to see it pay dividends. It's one of those unusual cards that um, is cryptically good. You know, it's like there's, there's, 
there's like this 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 sort of uh, life cycle of a card like this when it's first spoiled or released. Like everybody thinks it's wonderful. Like oh my god, non-creature spells you cast have convoked. That's amazing, you know. And so everybody just like overvaluates the cards. And then the competitive players get in there and they're like, nope, too conditional. And then they write it off. And for a lot of cards, that's where it ends. You know, <laughs> everybody thinks it's going to be amazing, and then it turns out to be bad and janky, and it doesn't work. But then sometimes cards like this, they have a third stage in their life cycle in which actually cryptically they were very good. Um, some cards that have done this in the past, in my experience, have been uh, Mystic Reflection. I have to change this to Historic so we can actually see that card. That was a card that I feel like a lot of people slept on. Like they tried to brew with it a little bit when it first came out, but they weren't, in my opinion, they weren't brewing with it correctly. And also we didn't have the cards during Kaldheim to really get the maximum value out of this. It wasn't until a set or two later that it got really good. And then like at the very end of the of its legality in the format, people were finally like starting to realize some of its competitive potential. So that was a card like that, that again, people first saw us like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then spikes got in there and they're like too conditional. Eh. And then finally, we realized at the very end, actually, there's competitive potential. Uh, the other one is Song of Creation, which didn't see a heck of a lot of play in Standard. It saw more play in Pioneer and a little bit in Historic in a classic combo deck. But it had life outside of the combo deck that, again, I felt like was mostly unexplored um, by people because it was hard to see how you would build a non-combo strategy around this. It took some very unusual type of brewing to get its maximum competitive potential. But when you did that, it was very good. And I have, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of uh, playing to some of the videos I've made myself because I have videos on my channel that explore both those cards. But of course, I'm going to give you examples that I'm, I'm intimately familiar with of these types of cards. But uh, what I'm saying is that, you know, Invasion of Segovia is that type of card. And then finally for red and blue, we have Ovika Enigma Goliath. This is a card that isn't seeing a lot of play, at least that I've seen. Um, and it could fit in with an Invasion of Segovia deck. I just wanted to flag it. Like this might be the thing that makes Invasion of Segovia more playable. Like, you, like I said earlier on, you can't just slot this into any deck and then it's going to do its thing. You have to commit to it. And Ovika Enigma Goliath, I don't think is something you'd want to normally play. And this is at Prowess deck that is seeing play but maybe you'd want to see it with Invasion of Segovia. So why is that? It's sort of a nombo because it's a legendary creature. So as a big spell with Invasion of Segovia, most of your big spells are going to want to be non-creature spells so that you can convoke them early, like White Sun's Twilight, right? So that's normally what you want, but this is a creature spell you can't do that with. So what the heck is it doing here? Well, it's an amazing combo piece. You know, on its own, it can be a huge threat and game finisher, probably not worth seven mana, you know, for the kind of finisher it is, but in the right deck, it could be, it could maybe be. It, its ability here, its triggered ability is really what's important. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create X11 goblin creature tokens where X is the mana value of that spell and they gain haste until end of turn. So if I'm casting, say, a five mana non-creature spell, I'm creating five new goblins. So the thing about invasion, you know, is that you're rarely ever going to be mana neutral or mana positive after you cast a non-creature spell. Even when you're making a bunch of tokens, you know, if you could make seven tokens at, with only seven mana, then you would be mana neutral because those tokens can then be used to convoke another seven mana spell. But you're typically spending additional mana on top of making those tokens. So you've spent seven mana and you're only making five tokens. The amazing thing about Ovika Enigma Goliath is they make every single non-creature spell you cast mana neutral with this convocability. That is enormous. And that's where we get into like kind of infinite mana, infinite spell casting, infinite card draw potential. It's not exactly infinite on its own. It does require a little bit of chance that you draw into more non-creature spells, but you can do a heck of a lot to make that maybe not 100%, but like drive up the margin so that it's very unlikely that you'll whiff, you know, when you do play the Ovika, or you can set it up so that you won't whiff when you do play the Ovika. So just on its own, every non-creature spell is mana neutral when you're playing with Cadus on the board as well. But then you add in other cards that might be able to generate tokens, like Invasion of New Phyrexia, but there are other ones that you might play in red instead. But in any case, so now you're spending seven mana to create five Blue Knight creature tokens and also seven Goblin creature tokens with haste. So essentially, you've just generated 12 additional quote-unquote mana that you can spend to convoke for non-creature spells if you have a flipped Cadus down. And now you're mana positive and you're generating infinite mana 
to a degree that then you can spend on things like huge silver scrutinies, draw your whole deck, find the exact cards you need, and on the way, you're making a ton of haste goblin creature tokens, which might be the game finisher you need the same turn you play this spell. That's the key here with, if you're gonna try to play Invasion of Segovia as a combo card, you need to be able to win very consistently the turn that you flip it. In Historic, we can do that much more easily than in Standard, but um, Ovika is maybe the one way that I can see so far we could do that in Standard. There are other things that might allow that to happen, and I'll talk about that in a minute, about the cards we could easily see coming out, common types of cards we don't currently have in Standard, but that would push this card over the top but in the time being, Ovika is the only real true combo way I can see to make this work. A little bit awkward that it costs seven mana, that it's a creature and not a non-creature, but maybe viable. Otherwise, I think what you want to play Invasion of Segovia as is this archetype that I call draw to win. So the core shell of the deck is not actually combo. It um, maybe looks more like mid-range than it does anything else but it's actually very different than mid-range. This is a bad mid-range card because on its own, it isn't very good. And that's typically how you evaluate cards in mid-range is just high value in a vacuum for the most part. But Invasion of Segovia, bad mid-range card, good draw to win card. If you wanna know more about what I mean when I say draw to win, I have a few videos on my channel about it, some decks that I call draw to win and a whole theory video that goes dive, dives deep into this kind of theoretical consideration of what is draw to win. But the main takeaway, if you don't want to dive into those videos, is that uh, with a draw to win deck, you can play with high synergy in mind, high micro combos, and card evaluation is very different because you don't have to just consider the card on its own when you're able to get enough consistent card draw. You know, And that's where that other rule comes in that I mentioned, that when you're able to get enough consistent card draw, the concept of card advantage doesn't matter anymore. It's not just that you have better card advantage, it's just the whole game of magic is fundamentally different. So cards like bounce and high synergy cards that are otherwise very narrow can suddenly become very good. You can have one of silver bullets in your deck that you can more reliably draw into when you need them, stuff like that. So there's very different... Um, kind of deck building philosophy that I think you would need to employ to really get maximum value out of Cadis, which is why I think a lot of people are gonna dismiss it. Finally, the other color combo and standard here that I could see reasonably is green, green-white. So one obvious thing to latch onto is King Darien, the, what is that, 48th? Is that how it is? Yeah. Uh, which pumps all your creatures. So if you're playing in a go-white token strategy, he's an anthem for three, that's good. But you can also sacrifice him to give the tokens you control. Um, hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. So now those one-sided board wipes with White Signs Twilight are even more one-sided because you actually get to keep all of your other token creatures, which is pretty awesome. Um, I think that that would be very playable in that style deck. The other card here that works really, really, really well with Invasion of Segovia is Awaken the Woods, which is just another one of those many types of cards out there that create a number of creature tokens equal to you know, two less than the total mana you spent to cast the card. So if you're spending seven mana, you're creating five tokens. But these have the upside that you don't even need the flipped invasion for them to do the thing that you want your creature tokens to do in the deck, which is to tap for mana, because this card makes those tokens lands that can tap for green mana. So suddenly, just with Awake in the Woods and, you know, a decent amount of mana up to have made a few of them, then now you're already looking at big silver scrutinies. And that makes this a much more reliable strategy um, than it might be in other decks. This is really the best thing you get in green, and King Darien is pretty good, but there are other ways that you can do that. There's the new invasion that, if you flip it, can give all of your creatures, not just your tokens, indestructible, for example. But um, this is really the best card for enabling this. So here's some cards that we might see in standard that aren't currently there, or types of cards, um, that would make a huge difference in the viability of playing Invasion of Segovia. So the first one up is Rally of Wings. This is an effect that we don't have any of in, in standard. I mean, there are some cards, I think, in standard that can untap all your creatures, but they're like creatures and they're only during combat or something like that. In any case, I've done an exhaustive search. I'm pretty sure there are no non-creature spells that do this. And this is so good, not because it pumps your creatures, it's because it untaps all your creatures. And it happens to be at a very cheap rate, this particular spell at two mana. But we do often you know, see this effect in standard. It's not that unusual to see a card like this. So if something is printed that's like this, this is what's starting to allow us to play a more combo style deck 
without a card like Ovika. Because what we can do is once we've flipped Invasion of Segovia, we can use our creatures to convoke for Rally of Wings. And now those same creatures we just convoked and any other creatures we've used to cast cards, they all untap and then we get to keep going off that same turn. Then we cast a huge Silver Scrutiny, leaving up two more creatures to tap for another Rally of Wings that we're trying to draw into. And this becomes much, much more viable. This is in Historic, so this is actually a very viable way to play it in Historic. And I've been playing around with this in those decks that I think are pretty competitive. And finally, the other card that we could see in Standard is something like Katilda Donhart Prime. This currently is in Standard, but I don't know that this is exactly the card we're looking for. But essentially, some creature that gives the ability of all of our other creatures to tap to add mana. There, there are a few effects like this, like there are others currently in Standard, such as Inga and Asika, but that only allows them to tap to cast a creature spell. So, um, you know, that's sort of a Nambo with Invasion of Segovia. But... In any case, something like Cathilda, the reason that I'm sort of iffy about it is that it has to be humans. And there are ways that we can make token humans, but there aren't really a lot of ways that we can make X token humans. Like these make white and blue knight creature tokens, but they're not humans. Otherwise, that would be pretty amazing. White Sun's Twilight makes mites, you know. So there's no real way to make X uh, tokens, which I think is a very important aspect of pairing it with Invasion of Segovia. But I do think that maybe Cathilda could be good Maybe in the future, there's another card printed that gives the ability to allow creatures you control to be tapped for mana. Uh, and then suddenly that is very similar to Awaken the Woods, in which you don't need um, the invasion of Segovia flipped in order to still do your thing. So if you can't find that card or you're having trouble flipping it, then you still have an out. You still have another viable way to still go off and do your thing and play huge silver scrutinies or ramp quickly up to White Sun's Twilight or whatever it is you're trying to do with a card like Katilda. So that's my TED talk about what I think is gonna be one of my new favorite cards in Magic Invasion of Segovia and why I think it's gonna be underrated and people are gonna be sleeping on it when um, it actually has some great potential value. Here's just a quick look at how I've brewed this in Historic. If you're interested in that, I'm not gonna do a whole deck guide in this video, but if you wanna see a deck guide, you know, you wanna know more about the deck, it's a very complicated deck to play. Uh, it's very powerful, really can consistently win the same turn that you flip Invasion of Segovia into Cadus. This is a true blue combo deck, um, that, and by that I mean that it can consistently win when you assemble the combo. There's also a lot of different ways to assemble different versions of the combo. So I think that this is a very fun deck. I encourage you to take a look at this if you're interested in how this might play in Historic. Um, this is obviously not part of the, this. Here's the Karn board, right? A bunch of artifacts you can pull out with Karn. That's very critical in part because of Paradox Engine. So, you know, another way to break Paradox Engine, although this deck does not need it at all in order to go off. And this is just a land I'm considering. So, you know, ignore that, but I'm, I'm considering whether or not we want to play Karn's Bastion for a very, very particular edge case <laughs> that I won't, I won't get into because the deck is very complicated and needs its own video. So happy brewing with Invasion of Segovia. Let me know uh, if you find success with this or this video helped you out in any way and like thinking about how to evaluate or brew with this card it'd be cool to hear what sort of successes and challenges you're having playing with this card happy brewing and i'll see you in the next one